This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer Ring Podcast. I'm Jamie Bogner. This is a special direct fire episode of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. That's what I'm going. That's, that's my new brand for this one. I like it. Direct fire. Um, we're calling it direct fire because we're taking your listener questions, folks, to listen to the podcast that you send to us via audio, and we are sharing those questions directly with a new brewer every month. And they are going to answer your brewing questions about their beers and their approach to brewing. Um, I've got a few questions that folks have sent me for my friend, Neil Fisher, who's joining us on this episode. Welcome, Neil. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I think you're the first person to show up three times now. On the oh podcast. man, you guys just can't get rid of me. So hey, you know, if we have to try something new, if we have to guinea pig something, uh, you know, you're the first person that I call. Oh, I'm honored. I really am excited. Um, I'm also a little nervous. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I usually know kind of what I'm going to talk about. Today I don't, and I I'm hoping I can answer these all appropriately because I had I didn't share the questions with you no. ahead of time. We're going to put you on the spot. Oh man, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see what you can come up with. Uh, on this, we should institute like a, a lifeline or a call a friend. <laughs> call a friend. Call a friend. Can I have like seven people on speed dial? <laughs> Do I have to list them first? <laughs> oh, well, anyway, we're going to work through this. We've got some great questions from folks uh, all across the country. And in fact, all across the world, the farthest question that we got is from a brewer in China of all wow. places. So uh, um, that just shows you just how truly global craft brewing is. And uh, also fantastic that people from that far away are listening to this crazy little podcast that we do. Um, speaking of firsts, you know, we've, you've been a part of a lot of firsts here with craft beer and brewing. In fact, um, you know, something that I've been working on this week is something you've been, you were involved in the very first one and that is our brewer's retreat. Oh, brewer's retreat. Brewer's retreat. Um, got a special news tease for all the folks that are listening to the podcast this week. Um, af the last time we did a brewer's retreat, uh, was back in 2019. Of course, they're kind of fantasy homebrew camp kind of deals where you come and brew in small groups with, uh, couple of, uh, you know, with some featured brewers that are inspiring, technically adept, super creative folks from, from around the country. Uh, you, you were there for the very first one that we did up at Devil's Thumb Ranch in, uh, in Colorado. Oh man. I think that I, I'm not even just, you know, this is going to sound more like I'm trying to blow smoke to, to get more favor, but it's by <laughs> far the most exciting and fun event I've ever been a part of. And not just the first, but all of them. And I think the experience is it's, it's probably where everything I connect back to, like in terms of like this career that um, now is over seven years that those are all highlights on every time they you guys have, you guys just have done an incredible job. So I, again, I'm just humbled. I get to be a part of it. I begged to be a part of it. You did it again. So I don't know if you had much <laughs> sure, of a sure. choice, but no, I can't wait. Um, I'm that glad seems we to be the it. way that everyone has gone in. In the first year you had just opened the brewery and just came to help out because we were friends and was like, Hey, you know, we've got some folks like Stephen Powell's brewing who have never brewed on a homebrew system before, you know, and like, we're going to need some people to know how to do things and they can kind of help need, out. Need an expert to help Stephen Powell's. Well, you, you know, <laughs> I'm going to tell him that. They, uh, they, he quickly caught on. I, don't, I mean, I remember that first year where suddenly it became like a race between him and Matt Reynoldson to like, you know, see who could knock out first. You know, I mean, it was, it was hilarious to oh, see. Man. You get, a, get some brewers together and everything becomes competitive in some way or another. <laughs> Uh, but over the years, you know, we did it and uh, did a bunch of them and did the last one in 2019. And after that 2019 one, uh, we actually had put them on ice and weren't planning on doing them again. And then the pandemic came. It was like, oh, glad we're not planning on events this year. And then by 2021, I was like, you know, I kind of miss those brewers retreat events. And so I, I just would talk to people and then get some texts from folks that had been a part of it in the past. And, you know, the conversations would start and folks like, uh, you know, Henry uh, from Monkish and Adriana had some dinner with them. And they were like, you know, you should bring that back. I'm like, should we? <laughs> and uh, anyway, it just became a thing. Well, here's the here's the thing. We're going to we're going to do it May 21st through 24th, 2023. The location is going to be, uh, let's call it Sonoma County, California. Um, I think we're going to, the location I think is going to be one that will be exciting to everyone who loves beer. Um, I don't want to say too much about that, but it's going to be pretty fantastic. Is it fair to describe it as a must-attend event? 
I mean, I, you I'm, tell me, I'm considering it a must attend event. Um, I'm going to guess that anyone that doesn't attend is going to probably regret it for a long time. It's going to be fun. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And, um, you know, anyway, I can't wait. Uh, what, one thing we are going to do is, uh, in order to take care of the folks that support us and that support craft beer and brewing, uh, we're going to give our all access subscribers first dibs on tickets to the event. So if it's something you might be interested in attending, then uh, you should become a, an all access subscriber, uh, somewhat quickly, uh, cause they will go on sale in the next couple of weeks, probably by the first of September. Stay tuned for more information on that. Other brewers that are participating. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I can't, I am, I'm so, excited anyway on this episode of the podcast we are going we've got listener questions for neil we're going to dig into those in a sec but first accubrew is an analytical tool designed to collect and compare the information brewers need to produce consistent results and continuously improve the process of fermentation accubrew is more than just a progress bar and early warning system it's an ever-evolving piece of technology tailored to you and your process save time and turn tanks faster Monitor and compare batch progress in real time. Enter notes, set custom reminders and temperature alerts, and detect process issues before a batch is ruined. Quality, consistency, and confidence, that is what AccuBrew delivers. Visit AccuBrew.io today for a no-obligation 90-day trial. This episode is also brought to you by CanCraft and BSG. Whether you need a full-service packaging experience from design to delivery or you just need some aluminum cans, CanCraft can do it. CanCraft's design and aluminum specialists are here to support your business every step of the way. Visit bsgcraftbrewing.com slash CanCraft to learn how CanCraft can help realize your brand potential. One more, what if you could chill your beer with a more efficient chiller? The answer, g and Chiller's new micro-channel condensers. g and micro-channel condensers are highly efficient in hotter regions. Use a fraction of the refrigerant over traditional chillers, which provides less opportunity for leaks along with lower global warming potential. g and Chiller's engineers are committed to green technology design while developing a more energy efficient chiller for the brewing industry. Contact g and Chillers today at gdchillers.com. Neil, what's new in your brewing world? Before we kick into some of these questions, anything uh, you know that's really tickling your fancy? Now, of course, this many years in, you're also moving into more of an executive leadership role, um, running the brewery and not as spending as much time in the brew house. But uh, on that product side, I know you're still involved because you can't not be involved. Uh, what's exciting to you these days? Um, you know, I think we're we're really starting to see a lot of you know for us a little bit scaling back on the number of SKUs and focusing more on developing some more stable cores. We've never done that, at least not, um, you know, after our first few months. And so it's been really awesome to, to be able to take a beer like Juicy Bits that we know now, it, you know, I think even up until just a couple of years ago, we were kind of wondering, is it going to just go away? Is this going to be a flash in the pan? Is And it's now prov- proven to be, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's become not just our flagship, but close to, you know, half our volume, a little bit less than half our production volume. And so it's been awesome to say, okay, half, half, wow. um, like between uh, probably this year around 40% and, and maybe as much as 50% uh, in 2023. So knowing that and kind of knowing that trajectory, knowing that's kind of what is on the horizon for growth for us, it's given us an opportunity to just continue to invest in that beer to make it as best as possible. And, and not just this, Hey, it's set in stone. It's um, it is what it is. And we just need to make it the same. It's, you know, there's all small micro adjustments we can make to continue to improve it. So, um, I am excited about that opportunity to just continue to, you know, make juicy bits, what we consider one of the better, you know, IPAs on the market and continue to improve it. Um, and from that, we've learned a lot about brewing IPA in general, brewing, um, with that yeast and then how we can adapt that into new SKUs that we're, um, putting some more, more effort into that, uh, could stick around longer too. So, um, we're always going to be trialing new things. I think our our big challenge is just how to continue to do that and also develop some consistency with core beers that we know, um, especially at the size now. You know, we're pushing fourteen thousand barrels or more this year, and that is a very different brewery than we were a few years ago. Sure, so, sure. Um, Sounds like we need to update that article on brewing uh, hazy IPA <laughs> for uh, for twenty twenty three. It's definitely yeah. We've we've learned a lot too, and then um, I think the biggest thing we're kind of focusing on right now is we're expanding our brew house so we got yeah. a big production expansion so 30 barrel brew house that'll 
definitely changed the way we brew. And so I think we're all, all kind of looking at what is it to, yeah, looking at 30 barrel brew house expansion. What does it mean to dial in recipes for the, you know, starting from scratch almost to obviously right. know what the beer needs to be, but how we brew it and design it and all that is going to be all variable. So it's kind of a fun and also a little bit stressful, uh, activity that we're all hopefully by year end, uh, firing that up. Sure. 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 Well, let's kick it off with a question about brewing IPA since uh, you brought it up. Uh, here's our first question. Hey, Neil. Hope you're well. Uh, my name is Brian Macbeth, and I'm a home brewer from Norwalk, Connecticut. And uh, first things first, I wanted to say thank you uh, for your openness, your your transparency, your willingness to give back uh, and and share, whether that be in the form of you know, recipes or other ideas and experiences you've had throughout the years. Um, I recently won a silver medal at the National Homebrew Competition for my New England IPA, and I credit that win to individuals like yourself who, again, are just so open and just willing to share. So I, I do want to thank you for that. Uh, I do have a question for you, though, and that question is around hop expression and pH. And I aim for a knockout pH in my New England IPAs of around five, and I do that for two reasons. Number one, I find that it helps with haze stability uh, for my New England IPAs, but also I find that you know once I dry hop, uh, the finished beer has a pH that you know is respectable, and, and as you know, when you dry hop, the pH level does increase. So, question for you is, you know, what have you found around again hop expression and, and pH levels? Do you aim for a specific uh, pH level in your finished beers that you dry hop? Do you ever adjust pH um, after you know dry hopping is done to get it to a certain um, level? So again, really want to know your thoughts and uh, what you have to say about that. Thank you. Wow, Brian. Uh, first of all, congratulations. That is super exciting. Um, and thank you for the kind words too. I um, I don't think I could win an NHC medal at all in, uh, in 2022. So that is very competitive landscape. Um, congratulations. I You have definitely brought up a very uh, interesting point that I think some, some of those um, – specifics on pH, we've not really evaluated, to be honest. So we definitely are, um, you're exactly right. pH uh, is has, you know, dry hopping in, in particular and, and even hops on the hot side have a pretty, you know, measurable impact to pH and, and kind of raising it and maybe in ways that you don't want or have not anticipated. So um, we're cognizant of that on the, especially on the hot side, um, when we're knocking out and then kind of know for yeast health, uh, we're trying to make sure we're, we're hitting those targets and we're probably right in line with you around that five or well, maybe a little bit higher, but, um, we're taking that approach more from a yeast health and, um, and even during hot side, kind of some conversion and, and mash efficiency perspective, but not really from the hop expression. That's, I think an interesting perspective and even, a, an interesting case study to try to dive more into. Um, I think there's definitely, I think we, we all know dry hop rates have probably on average increased in the last, I would say decade of, of IPA brewing. And, um, it would be interesting to see what, um, some trials with maybe acidifying, you know, post, post dry hop, even maybe prior to packaging to see what impact that has on hop expression. I think aroma would be really, cu- I would, I'd be very curious what the results would be on aroma. Um, and then obviously flavor too. Um, you, you may have piqued an interest that we may trial here, or if, uh, anybody else trials it, I'd love to know the results. I have not seen anything, um, substantial in, in, in any papers, but, um, I probably have not stayed ed- in tune with that as well, but I think it'd be super curious to see what just, uh, hop expression changes happen when you're, um, really trying to target a specific pH. I think, uh, here internally, when we have high, heavily dry hop beers, um, we've already accounted for that on the, uh, hot side with some acidification, but we don't really measure it again, um, to buffer in the, uh, post post fermentation. So I am super curious. What a great question. Thank you. It is an interesting one. I, you know, I was talking to a brewer in the Midwest who, uh, you know, was a professional brewer who had been following up because there's some, apparently some fantastic homebrew talk threads about this of, of brewers that are deconstructing and, uh, doing chemical analysis on certain brews from certain brewers just to, to kind of 
measure where what the you know kind of components are, what you know salts, what you know what what specific things they are using. And there's and, and there's some interesting questions out there about finishing uh, finishing pHs on these and the way that it drives hop expression. Um, it's certainly something, uh, and that question actually spurs me on to see uh, other questions I can ask some of the other people that are part of some of that research, and we'll try to dive into some of that and get some direct. Be answers. a really fun trial if uh, if we end up starting to to change ph and, and juicy bits and it improves the beer i owe you a case of, of uh juicy bits brian so there you I, go i love that question you should probably talk to, i bet ross canning can also talk to something about that because he's the he's the kind of guy who'd have that kind of data absolutely him. yeah yeah let's pick up another question here hello jamie and neil this is scott hunt from wild west brewing in chengdu china first i want to send a big thank you to neil for helping me set up my hazy ipa process about five years ago we had lots of emails back and forth. It's rare to get Weldworks beers here in China, but we did manage to get hold of some mixed berry pie Berliner recently. We were all totally blown away by the way the pie crust flavor came through. So my question this time is how do you go about creating that amazing pie crust flavor with malts? Thanks again, Neil. Scott, thanks for the question, and uh, it's great to hear from you, and uh, hopefully things are going well. I, I definitely remember uh, connecting, and um, I'd love to try the beer sometime and see how it turned out, the hazy IPA that um, we chatted about. So, Scott uh, got a, Scott was here uh, as a part of the Brew Accelerator program back in the day when we were, which, not to be totally self-promotional, but we are bringing back here next year in February also. In February, and I think we're kicking it off here and at Weldworks. And we're going to do the kickoff right here at Weldworks, the uh, opening night seminar, dinner, tour, and everything right here. Awesome. I'm, we're excited to host, too. I, we've we've been a part of it, um, but we haven't gotten to actually host more than, I think, a technical tour. So um, that should be fun. But um, to answer your question, I... You know, I think uh, a lot of the challenges with whether it's pastry stout, pastry sour, um, these dessert flavors, a lot more delicate, uh, it, and it definitely can be, I think, a challenge to make it integrated with the base beer. And I think a lot of it can be, like you mentioned, can be started with the, the malt. And I think you can start with that grist and figuring out which malts help accentuate some of those flavors. Um, you know, honey malt is a really good candidate for a lot of these, you know, if you're, whether you're talking pie crust flavor or, you know, just in terms of a dessert baseline, there's, um, do you know off the top of your head, like what kind of threshold you'd need to hit for it to be perceptible? Cause you're talking about a really flavored dense beer. Yeah. I, you know, I would say, I would say you wouldn't get much below 5%. I think anything above 10, you get a little nervous too. So, um, I think targeting like a 5% with something like a honey malt, um, even some specific caramel malts that I think can really express a lot more kind of candy and toffee notes that re integrate with, depending on what kind of, you know, dessert flavor you're trying to evoke. Um, you know, some of my favorites are kind of that higher love of bond for sure is always great, but, um, things like double roasted crystal is a really fun one, has a very toffee like note without kind of over. Sometimes that overly caramel note is just kind of cloying, um, even if your you know attenuations are all dialed in. So something like a double roasted crystal, um, those I would say honey malt and double roasted crystal be awesome candidates to integrate um, those you know something along those lines for your grist. And then obviously whatever flavors you can um, work with, we you know we we do use a surprising amount of um, all sorts of ingredients, adjuncts that we did not consider to be adjuncts years ago and figuring out when to integrate them and then how much to use and, um, and also how to accentuate them. I think, uh, especially when you're playing with fruit too, you want to, you know, when you put a beer out there that is called, you know, mixed berry, um, pie Berliner or something along those lines, you want all, obviously the fruit to be kind of front and center, some balanced acidity, but you also need that kind of, you know, that actual pie and, and dessert flavor too. So, I think trying to figure out how to integrate them all and make them all express accordingly is the is the challenge. And I, I love that you are starting with the grist. That's a really intentional place to start if you're designing a recipe like that. Are there any uh, kind of extracts that you use to high point the aroma on that? I mean, obviously, you you know, especially in these fruit forward beers, you're using a lot of real fruit and a real fruit puree, um, you know, but often to kind of, you know, fine tune and give some of these uh, clarities of expression, uh, you know, a little bit of extract ingredients can, can just high point those things. What do you, are there specific things that you find that, that just, you know, can be some special ingredients that help put things over the top? 
Yeah, I think especially when you're talking the adjunct side, you know, something like pie, crust, graham cracker, um, things that are much harder to keep versus fruit. You know, we, we depend on a lot of uh, purees, a lot of even juice concentrates. So we'll focus a lot more on the fruit side of that. And then for extracts, we've trialed a lot of different products. And I think, you know, at this point, if you're trying to convince customers that it tastes like this it has to it can't just be a um you know hand wavy <laughs> sure, oh yeah sure. you, you get the pie crust it's like no I, I don't because it's not there um so we'll use you know we'll actually use some pie um either sometime usually in the mash we'll use actual pie we'll use pie crusts um, actual pie crusts we do and how much flavor we get there is negligible <laughs> it's very little but there is definitely still we're still using it but then how much we accentuate some of those flavors will all depend on the base beer and so um you know i think trialing with different extracts extract pro providers different levels um the one thing we is kind of hard fast rule is we never want artificiality to overwhelm sure, sure. and that's i think a really hard balance so you always have to support with real ingredients but to get aroma to come through um if you're depending on you know especially fermented ingredients that are gonna lose some potency in the fermentation process fruit in particular um you're trying to figure out what between juice concentrate and puree which one will will have more residual aroma flavor um how you attenuate that we've obviously trialed stuff you know especially when you're talking like a smoothie style sour where we're not fermenting all the fruit or any of the fruit um that obviously is a little bit you know that's a different challenge altogether with pasteurization. But um, when you're not doing those and you're doing something that is going to be fully attenuated, that presents some opportunities to, hey, how, how, which fruit can we source? And then are there opportunities to, on the adjunct side especially, boost with extracts to get that aroma and even some of that flavor too that you can't get with just the ingredients alone. Are there any extracts that really help? point that that pie crust element to it or and You'd then be also surprised there's yeah. there's probably i would guess there's probably a dozen that would describe themselves as pie crust and then you know you start to trial you start to experiment and you find out that not all of them are equal and then um i think even the the point that scott brought up is how those are integrated with the, the grist and how you can maybe adjust some of your grist choices to integrate better with those but um, the best experience we found is just to continue to you know, try different products and then really focus. I think the, I think the best advice we've kind of given or also received was make it about the authentic authenticity of the flavor, but it has to be expressive. So, you know, subtlety can, is absolutely a part of, of almost every, you know, beer and style. There's definitely a, a position where subtlety works. There's also a, a point where it's, you know, it doesn't move the needle at all for, for what you're trying to accomplish in terms of a, you know, a very unique or, or distinct flavor experience, especially when you're talking more dessert. I think that that's kind of the distinction when you're getting into that dessert territory, whether it's a sour or a stout, it can get lost. And so uh, we don't really like calling a beer something if it doesn't really evoke that right away, either from aroma or flavor. A big role does vanilla play in that? Vanilla is, you know, we use a lot of vanilla beans and those are sourced from all over. We're a little bit more intentional about trying to trial specific origins for beers that are focused on vanilla, uh, especially in Medianoche and some of the barrel aged stouts. Um, but we do buy a lot of vanilla. We spend a lot of money on vanilla. And so finding good sources for vanilla has been, um, it might be one of the only things we don't share as much because of the vendor we, uh, <laughs> we have a very good relationship and we'll plug them to other industry peers. But um, having access to some of those ingredients, especially when you're starting to talk about- Is uh, it Ted? It, you know, it could be Ted. Yeah, it is Ted. <laughs> it is Ted. That but, secret's but already which, out. <laughs> well, but the origin, we're trying to make sure we can get those uh, first dibs on some of the origins we've had a challenging yeah, time yeah. getting. Fair enough, um, fair enough. And I'm also ready for the vanilla selection uh, trip to half these places. I think Fiji and nice. Tahiti would be fun, Papua New Guinea and uh, Congo. I think, uh, I think there should be a Brewers. Maybe you guys could host a Brewers vanilla selection trip. <laughs> so, uh, we're not qualified all, to do that all the but, vanilla well yeah, you could host yeah. it as a you know I, i'm sure there'd be a an opportunity to combine it with something else brewer's retreat style but that sounds that sounds fantastic sign me up for that um <laughs> when it comes to vanilla extract real beans you mix the both uh, you know obviously you've got beers at different price points that need to be different things for different people um how do you balance that out and make sure because obviously it can't taste synthetic no matter what 
type of product to use. Yeah, I think I think if you're gonna, you have to use both. Probably that's the answer. You got to start with um, whole bean for most products that are really trying to express some complexity of vanilla. If you're just using generic vanilla as a, you know, ingredient in, a, in the whatever pastry beer, that's fine too. Um, and maybe the actual vanilla beans aren't as essential, but sourcing great beans um, and then sourcing good, if you're using extract is sourcing um, authentic and you're also looking at concentrate, you know, how, what's the concentration of it. Um, sometimes you're, you're paying more than, than you would for an extract because you have to use more of it to get that expression than you would if you were to process it yourself. And we've, you know, trialed some of that too and where that's added and how long and, 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 you know, if you're recirculating or anything like that, those are all, you know, at some point vanilla beans become, um, you know, you could potentially figure out a workflow and process that you could get better use of a whole vanilla beans than you could from extract. But obviously the extract side of things too, if you find the right provider and the right source, those can be really great products and save you a lot of the work of how to, you know, none of us are running vanilla extract processing facilities. <laughs> sure, sure, Some of sure. us might in integrate that, but. That's, that's next, right? Yeah. All right, another question. Hey, Neil, this is Josh from Afterglow Brewing. Uh, we're a brewery and planning in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we're hoping to open later this year, maybe early next year. Um, I was wondering about uh, making a stout and uh, when you guys are making like a base stout uh, for either your media noches or any other kind of stouts you're doing, um, what grains or adjuncts do you guys like to use um, to thicken your beer? Um, I know like uh, when I make stouts, um, I know like the flaked wheat and the flaked oats, like I like to use some of those, but um, what kind of ratios do you like to use? And um, I guess like with boil time, I know with the noches, it's a little different, but I was wondering with like, if you were just making like a base stout and you wanted to be nice and thick, um, what, what would you do to make that? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Josh. That's a great one. Um, you know, I would say mouthfeel is probably the, I'd say it's the most important sing, singular area to focus on when producing and designing recipes for stout. Um, I think that's the biggest delineation between really good stouts and, and just okay stouts. And I think um, it, it's not exclusive to barrel aged stouts. It's kind of all across the board. So whether you're brewing a, you know, four or 5% oatmeal stout or sweet stout, all the way up to 12 to 15% barrel aged stout, I think the ones that really start to stand out are where that focus on mouthfeel. And it's not just, uh, you know, sugar, it's not just uh, attenuation, it's not just how much residual um, gravity is left, it's a mouthfeel component. So I think you're asking the right question in terms of, of grist is where it starts back to, you know, some of the other things we've already talked about. But the grist for uh, Media Noche in particular is still very much, you know, we're still depending on, on oats a lot, flaked oats. Um, I want to say they're just under probably 8% of the total grist. Um, I have to look back and see what our most current recipes, they've obviously evolved a little bit. Um, but somewhere in that 7 to 10% range is probably a great starting point. Is it absolutely essential at this point for Medianoche? That's probably a question I have as we, you know, evaluate our gravities are pushing, you know, sometimes as high as 38 to 40 Play-Doh. Um, we're probably averaging closer to 35. And then how we attenuate, we're still using our same, uh, we're actually using dry yeast for Medianoche, mainly because of how high a pitch rate we need to get. And then we don't use that yeast in any other, um, we obviously can't reuse it from Medianoche. Which is USO5. USO5. Yeah. And then uh, if we're doing a Cali or English or Cali or American style beer, we'll use O5 typically. So we're not keeping that house, we're not using it as a house yeast at all. We don't have... Um, other beers we're producing with it, so it's hard to, if we were trying to scale it up for Media Noche, it'd just be kind of a log logistical nightmare. And plus, at the pitch rates we're trying to get, you know, when you're trying to attenuate 35 plus Play Doh beer, um, you need you need all the cells you can get. So, <laughs> yeah, dry sure, yeast sure. is really effective in that. Um, so, with, with that in mind, our attenuations can range, and that has a big impact on mouthfeel as well. And I think what we're really trying to avoid is cloying. And I think that can be where, if you're dependent too much on you know, final gravities for your, your mouthfeel instead of maybe grist or even some other changes. That's where I think you lose a little bit of that design and intentionality with stout. Um, I think oats are great. I think there's plenty of other malts too that would add, um, you know, you, you, even wheat, we've done some wheat focused, uh, batches of Medinoche where, 
Um, if we know we're getting like weeded bourbon casks, um, Weller, for example, or, or even some wheat whiskey casks, we can really try to accentuate the base barrel character with whatever that wheat whiskey was or the weeded bourbon and put a little bit more emphasis on the wheat. So in those recipes for Medio Noche, we've used weeded uh, flaked wheat. We've used wheat malt as well. Um, and those tend to have, just like weeded bourbons, they, they tend to have a more distinct mouthfeel that it is it, you know, it's not thicker or more full, but it definitely seems a little bit more distinct from just our base kind of oatmeal stout, which is, um, or oatmeal flaked oats for um, the base made in Noche that we use in probably 80% of those batches. So um, I think you can play around with a lot of different options for malt, for mouthfeel. For, you know, say a, a non-barrel aged stout that uh, still needs to be thick and rich, but also not cloying, you know, are there, you know, some, some different texts? You, you then also don't have the levers of roast and, uh, you know, bitterness to all, to help, uh, cut some of that sweetness. Um, you know, are there any specific, uh, specific tricks you use in that kind of context? Yeah. Th- I mean, sometimes those can be just as challenging. Um, Media Noche, we've just produced the same way for so long now that we just know exactly all the variables we have. The boil times, um, obviously impact even that caramel flavor and caramelization, and then bitterness, and and we can tolerate a little bit more roast because of gravity. So when we're designing smaller stouts, um, and with mouthfeel in mind, we're really, really depending on the grist even more. I would say, and and targeting the right attenuation. We don't want a cloyingly sweet. Um, sometimes you can you can start with a very high gravity, um, uh, terminal gravity beer uh, that's going into barrels and casks, and you can you know, extend those ages or choose the right casks that maybe some tannin would add, you know, a little bit of balance. Um, obviously even some, some roast profile from the barrels themselves, all that can help balance that kind of really high gravity beer. You don't have as many of those options, uh, when you're brewing something that's, you know, a little fresher, a little bit smaller and not meant to be aged. So, uh, grist is even more important. And I would say, um, for us, it's trying to make sure we're fully attenuating those beers, not, we, we have a, a lot of tolerance with Medi Noche because we know we have blending, we know we have age and all these other components that are on our side with a fresh beer like, um, you know, maybe a 7 or 8% pastry stout or something else that we're going to do some sort of adjunct treatment to. We'll design those, make those changes with those adjuncts in mind. So if coffee is a really great candidate where we know there's going to be, we'll, we'll dial back on the, on the roasted barley or even chocolate malts a little bit knowing if we're going to be adding some coffee. And, and vice versa, we can even push some of those roast characteristics if we know we're going to be adding sweeter adjuncts like coconut um, for balance. And then hops are, are always kind of your baseline. We don't dry hop anything uh, stout or, or dark or malty, um, but obviously even just uh, just base hot side hops for baseline bitterness is, um, I still think, important even if uh, trends have changed on, you know, American stout in particular feels very different today than it did 10 years ago where hops were a driving flavor component. Now it's, I think, baseline bitterness. They can be a, a driving flavor uh, contributor again. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't think that's it's the all, vast yeah. majority of the market right now. Not right now, but, but it will be. It I, will be. Yeah. I, I love a hoppy stout. On those, are there any other you know ingredients that uh, might find their way into the, the malt bill that can help build body without uh, leaving a, a bunch of cloying sweetness. Cause especially at a seven or 8% kind of beer where you're adding other ingredients, they're going to heighten the idea of sweetness. The last thing you want is it just to come across as an entire sugar bomb that where people can't finish it, uh, you know, it can while at the same time you want it to have that kind of silky feel to it. Are there any other tricks that you employ to, to build that kind of idea of mouthfeel or, or at least the perception of it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously flake products are all pointing to, towards the same thing as, uh, as dextrin malts too. So your Cara, Cara pills and dextrin, dextra pills, anything, you know, dextrin, dextrinous malts that we know are likely not going to attenuate very far, especially if you're not worried about, you know, if you're not adding a lot of hops, you're not getting any of the hop creep to, to break down some of those dextrinous malts. But um, so you can focus, you don't have to just use flaked oat, flaked wheat, flaked you know, flaked rye or anything else. Um, rye is another one though. We, um, chocolate rye in particular definitely is, uh, probably one of my favorite malts in, in stout because it does, it, it has that, uh, roast character, that baseline for me, the expression of chocolate rye compared to some other chocolates, you know, even some of the lighter chocolates is it definitely comes across a little bit more milk chocolate driven, uh, which is a little bit more in line with what you're looking for and something that's not going to age forever. 
Um, and so it also does have a mouthfeel component to it. I think that's distinctly different from, um, your base, you know, whether it's a pale or, or dark chocolate malt. And so we'll use that in tandem. Um, we haven't done a lot of trials with corn or, or flaked corn. Um, but I have, you know, it, 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 at least anecdotally talked to others that have seen flaked corn as a pretty distinct, um, component and addition that's different from say flaked oats. Hmm. So something this, we've tried a little bit of corn when we're doing some, you know, bourbon focused, obviously we're still all, almost all bourbon, but if we wanted to really dive into that, we'd probably see what kind of expression we get from corn. I think, you know, the, the connection between corn and bourbon is not quite the same as what it is with malt and beer, but there's, sure. there's definitely some of those flavor components. All right, next we've got a series of two questions, and here we'll kick it off with the first one here. Hi, Neil. This is Tyler from Mesa, Arizona. Weldworks Hefeweizen has been in the lineup since the beginning. Over the years, what have you learned about yeast selection, pitch rate, temperature, and headspace when fermenting Hefeweizen? Now, this is a warning. You just brought that brought Hefeweizen back. We did. We, we discontinued it year-round. Oh, man, I can't remember if it was, it was close to two years ago. Um, it was the last kind of hold out from the early days of core beers and flagships and um back when we thought that you know we'd be making more wheat beer than ipa and so we you know didn't really put a lot of effort into ipa recipe development for a while and really moved the needle the other direction but (laughs) (laughs) kind of of ripped away but um but hefeweizen is very near and dear to my heart um i love i love wheat beer in general you guys won a medal for that one too we did we won our very first medal um which was kind of a unlikely, you know, it, it was not a beer we anticipated winning with. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that beer, but it was, you know, you're always looking at the docket and, and what's brewing or what you're entering and then where you think you have the best chance. And that was not necessarily one that I thought we would have as good a chance as maybe some other beers we entered. But um, I think what, you know, for us, we've we've kind of continued to adapt a little bit of how we brew that beer when it comes back. It's definitely not one that we make year round anymore. And we probably won't bring it back anytime soon year round, but, um, it does really well on draft, uh, especially here in the tap room. It's a really great beer to, uh, it's a food beer. It's a good food beer. We don't, you know, with so many hoppy beers, so many st- stouts and sours beers that pal- pair well with a wide range of food is kind of more difficult. And especially when now we have a kitchen, uh, with the annex food and, uh, Tim and, and the team there putting together dishes, finding beers that can you know, not just pair, but also can, you know, be enjoyed alongside a good dish are much more challenging. So it's really fun to have it back. Um, it's also changed a little bit in our approach because we're not brewing it more con- consistently. It does make a yeast challenge in particular. So we've tried a lot of different yeasts, yeasts uh, over the years. It uh, It's ranged from um, like an American half strain to a more traditional German half strain. Um, we kind of rotate it around and it's it's kind of landed a little bit in the middle more uh, now it's it's utilizing a more traditional half strain um, but we are not trying to push the especially the phenolic components as high as what maybe a traditional German half would be um, for me what this I think makes a, a great American half um, you know the ones that I think of like like uh, Widmer's you know iconic um, half of Eisen that very you know bubble gummy and, and banana driven so very ester driven. Um, but somewhat restrained phenolics. I think the, um, you know, the clove is, is there, but it's not uh, overwhelming. Um, and, and you still have some hop expression too, which is how we designed and continue to brew our half. So um, I'd say that the best, best advice I can give on, on yeast in particular is to identify what, you know, what kind of yeast or what kind of, you know, whether if it's Hefeweizen or even another wheat beer, what kind of flavor expression you're going to target. Um, if you're looking very traditional, even a Belgian wit or something along those, those lines, I think you're, you know, if you want that classic expression from Germany or from Belgium, if you're making wit, then it's trying to pick those traditional yeasts versus you have a little bit more latitude when you're making a, your own take on it or an American take on it. And trying to find something that fits your needs. There's so much, so many different yeast strains these days that I think uh, homebrewers have a lot better access to than 
uh, when I was brewing even 10 years ago, I feel like such an old timer back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, but, uh, but even just the advances in, right. in everything, I think it's, it's given all just, and not just home brewers, but professional brewers are, our access to yeast and our understanding of yeast is, it feels like it's growing just as quickly as, as hops too. Um, from a headspace and, and, um, you know, I think pressure is a very interesting, um, variable that I, I we you know, there's lots of different, uh, approaches, whether it's fermenting under pressure, whether it's, uh, reducing osmotic pressure to, you know, you, I think you can do both to, to both enhance, uh, or, it, you know, increase ester production. Um, we've obviously seen, you know, initially we, we use the same fermenters. We don't have any dedicated, you know, Hefeweizen or, or even estuary fermenters. I think that, um, that approach though could be very, especially in a homebrew environment, trying to see what kind of headspace impact or more headspace, what impact that has on ester development, if that's what you're trying to, to accomplish. But I don't know if I could tell you that, you know, re reducing the osmotic pressure has a positive impact on ester production and a lower anecdotally. That's what we've seen in some of the beers we were brewing, you know, especially half of we were brewing maybe, um, maybe a 20 barrel knockout into a 30 barrel fermenter, that additional headspace may have had a different impact. Obviously that was when you're trying to, you know, on a 15 barrel brew house, maximizing, especially Hefeweizen being a little bit lower gravity, you could knock out closer to 20 and we have a 30 barrel fermenter available. So that had an impact. I think, um, in hindsight, we weren't tracking it very clearly. And then we started to find out like, Oh, you know, having that much headspace or, or not having it, um, definitely has a changes that beer. Um, not as substantially as you might anticipate, but it does produce a different beer. So what you're trying to produce, I think the first thing you have to know is your equipment and your fermenters in particular, and what, what options you have, what safe measures you can take, whether, you know, fermenting under pressure is something I've always, especially as a homebrewer, always wanted to try a little bit more of, um, but spunding valves are, you know, they need to be very, very, uh, fail safe. So yeah. That, yeah. How do you control the clove expression? Uh, and it sounds to me, you know, and I, and I love this approach of suppressing some of that clove, but then pushing back some of that through hop expression in that to keep the structure there, but having it not appear quite so herbal, quite so like peppery, um, you know, how do you, how do you accomplish that then through your fermentation process and through your recipe and hop design? You know, I, th I feel like, uh, esters are, at least in my experience have been a lot easier to manipulate either direction with uh, temperature, uh, especially fermentation temperature seems like the best, you know, that's the, probably the primary driver for esters. Obviously pitch rates do have impact that too. But on the other side, I think um, pitch rates in particular have, we've seen, especially if you're lowering pitch rates to push expression of esters and, and push ester production higher, it does seem to also push uh, at least anecdotally, it seems like the phenolic character, especially on yeast that you know will drive phenolics, that seems to be some of the byproducts too. So if you're really focusing mostly on expression of, or even ester production, and you want higher esters and lower phenolics, you may not be able to depend on pitch rate without having both uh, impacted. So potentially fermentation may be a better option if you're if you're trying to make an ester-driven beer that uh, is restrained in phenolics. That's where we found that you can kind of push those temperatures a little higher. Um, yeast straining yeast in general is where, where you get, you know, ester production to, um, to really fine tune it. I think, uh, the best way to do it is to probably select yeast appropriately. So if you get a very phenolic driven strain that you're trying to mute, it's going to be a much bigger challenge than just a strain that is not as, uh, does not throw as many phenolics. We've got one more. We've got another question, a second question from Tyler next. Hi, Neil. This is Tyler from Mesa, Arizona. Mede Noche is known for its layers of malt-derived chocolate flavors. What techniques do you use when mashing dark malts to achieve these prominent chocolate flavors? Yeah, that's a great question, Tyler. I think um, I think diversity is your friend. I think uh, a wide selection of, of roasted and chocolate malts is where we found the best expression of complexity. Um, for Midi Noche in particular though, there's definitely, I think we've learned a lot that, uh, that barrels and, and specific, whether it's age or, or specific, uh, sources from different distillers, bourbon barrels in particular, they do express 
um, a good amount of, especially over 18 to 36 months or longer, they, they express roast. And, um, and so if you don't account for that, you can end up with a beer that is more roasty than you planned. Um, so that's kind of the first step is kind of working backwards from that. What is the, what is the impact the oak and the wood is going to have on, if you're saying roast in particular, um, for us, the complexity of that roast is really important. So, uh, we use a lot less roasted barley than we used to, um, nothing wrong with roasted barley, but it is very, um, it can be pretty overwhelming. It can be, it can go into that kind of char, uh, astringent kind of ashtray, um, expression pretty quickly and uh and especially if you're adding other chocolate malts um debittered malts those all um i think trying to vary all those and then getting to know those malts pretty intimately and then being able to design recipes knowing that um we do a lot so we'll we'll have uh, like i mentioned uh, chocolate rye is a big one we really like um we use some pale chocolate we use occasionally some regular chocolate a little bit of roasted barley and then a lot of debittered um dark malts, uh, whether it's crop, special one, two or three. And, um, there's even some others that, uh, even some like chocolate wheat is like midnight wheat is a lot of fun. Um, I feel like, you know, it might, might be over, might be over architecting it to have, you know, a, a goal of four different roasted malts, dark roasted malts, but Made Noche has at least that many and sometimes more, um, depending on the, on the barrels that we're going into. And, uh, I don't think we've ever, especially if we're looking at overall roast, we, we consider them all as one percentage that we're trying to, you know, adjust some of those numbers, but we don't ever just say, Hey, we, you know, we can do this with one, one of these and say, you know, let's just call it, uh, I can't remember if 12 to 13% maybe of something that ex- exceeds, um, 150 love a bond or something darker than that, uh, probably closer to 200. Uh, even the, difference in pale chocolate and regular chocolate is pretty, um, it's, it's very, very, you know, I think those two are almost don't even feel like the same malt if you were to call them chocolate, um, and who you source them from the maltsters, they're all very, very different. So I think getting to know your, your source ingredients is probably the first step, but I don't think you can have too much complexity with chocolate malt. Sure. Sure. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for the opportunity to ask Neil a question. I'm Lauren Sunby from Edmonton, Canada. Neil, your brewery is proud of its contribution to community. You give to the marginalized, you support diversity, and you champion inclusion, and you try to make Weld County a better place. Yet across America and Canada too, lots of places are just happy to brew beer, pay the bills, and meet payroll. In your own words, why is it important to you that Weld works as a contributor to the community? Why does that commitment resonate for you at a personal level as it obviously does? Thanks. That is, um, that is a great question and uh, one I really like too. So selfishly, uh, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> this is definitely, I'll, I'll say this is a Neil Fisher perspective that um, also does overlap with Weldworks. Um, but I think when we were starting this business and me personally having some background in nonprofit and getting to know kind of some, some of the nonprofit structures, um, what it means to, you know, find a, a purpose, uh, in a specific, you know, group of, of people that you're trying to, um, accommodate or, um, you know, for example, Habitat for Humanity, um, has been an organization that I've always really resonated with. Um, I think housing stability is a, is a very big, um, it's a, it's a huge need in everywhere in the U S and across the world in well County in particular, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's something we're all trying to address and figure out an answer to. And I don't think anyone has great answers. I think there's organizations that are working towards that like habitat. And for me, um, you know, from opening this business, I, I definitely was excited about the opportunity to brew the opportunity to, um, express some creativity. Um, I love that that was for me, my expression of creativity. I don't consider myself a creative, um, just by nature. I'm I'm not a good artist. I'm not good. Couldn't draw, um, beyond a stick figure. And I found kind of my creative outlet was brewing and that designing recipes and that expression, um, something I don't do as much today, but it's still that kind of ethos. But, 
Um, what I think excited me most about starting a brewery or starting a business was that opportunity to figure out how we could be a part of the community community and, and the part of the conversation of making this place better, whether it's Greeley or Weld County or Colorado or, you know, whatever uh, we consider our community and our, our area. And that, um, it was important from the beginning. It's become even more important today. And is I think that's probably what has kept it as a value for us, a core value as a business that we started it when we did not have the resources or the, you know, manpower or anything that we have today, we were still finding ways to engage and give back and, and really connect. And I think it's one thing to give, you know, funds and, 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 and donations, which is valuable. And we, I mean, our goal is, is close to $300,000 in just cash donated back to nonprofit uh, partners here in Colorado and specifically Will County, uh, which is a lofty goal and, and one that we're still pretty, you know, we're on track to, to hit, I hope. Um, and it hopefully grows from there. But beyond just that, it's the engagement piece that I think that really resonates with um, myself, I think on our team. Um, we want to make sure that we're not just, you know, we can write checks and that's great. And I, those nonprofits all need resources, but they also need, sometimes they need personnel and, and, and actual service hours, which we want to create an environment where that's not just, um, you know, promoted, but also compensated. We pay for volunteer hours. We want to make sure that there's also a platform. If there's a nonprofit that, uh, we want to work with that could maybe use some more exposure for a cause they're working on, or maybe an initiative or a fundraiser. You know, beer is sexy and fun, so people listen to us. Even if uh, you know our, we don't have a cause, we can make their cause ours and, and give them a platform that uh, may not happen otherwise. Or it's just about us saying, "Hey, we're we're in this together here in Greeley. We're trying to solve the same problem. Um, where can we align our efforts? Where can we be a part of that conversation?" I think I do think it is easy for our industry to kind of you know step back and say we're not equipped to to make some of these changes. We're not equipped to help solve these problems. And, uh, you know, I think that's an easy scapegoat. I think that's an easy way to kind of sideline yourself. Um, it doesn't mean you have to solve all of it. It doesn't mean you have to give away all your money either. Um, it means that you have to run a business. You have to, you know, in order to keep employees paid and keep your lights on, you have to make financial business decisions that, um, are different for a, you know, a business than they are a nonprofit. But it also means that, we have resources and opportunities to do things distinctly. Um, we do have our own 501c3 nonprofit, the uh, WellWorks Community Foundation. Um, the fun thing about that is that we get to, you know, use that to partner alongside nonprofits in some more intentional and tangible ways that we haven't always been able to do. And so um, community engagement is really important for us. This year has been fun because ha housing stability was kind of our core focus. There's a lot of different initiatives that we're you know, whether it's our tips, 100% of our tips um, in the tap room and uh, for all everything on site here, 100% of those go back to the foundation to be distributed to different nonprofit partners. So our staff um, get an opportunity to determine which nonprofits receive those. Um, and so we have that, but we have a lot of different uh, initiatives that we're also focusing on that all, at, at least in some capacity this year, is kind of pointing back to that housing stability question. So that, that's a very long-winded answer, and obviously you can tell it is something I'm excited about. I think it's uh, it's also a legacy question that, you know, just seven years into this, you have some, not existential crises, but you do have moments where you step back and say, you know, is, is Juicy Bits going to survive 20, 30 years? Is that going to be a legacy we leave behind? Or is the work we do in the community going to, you know, be what we leave behind, whether we're doing this in another 20 to 30 years. So I think that question has been a little bit more front of mind, especially after COVID and seeing just how challenging uh, everyone's, you know, there's lots of things going on in the world. And I think we were okay sitting on the sidelines for a while and we're not anymore. So. All right. Well, let's uh, finish this off with one last brewing question. And I think you'll uh, recognize the, the guy who's asking this one. Hey, Neil, this is Joe over at Pine House. I uh, got a question for you. I was up at the fest um, and I was really enjoying a lot of the West Coast IPAs that you guys are doing. And uh, I'm kind of curious what you guys are doing uh, technique wise, if you're integrating some of the stuff that you've learned on the, you know, the juicy bit side, or if you're kind of blank slate and, and keeping a more traditional West Coast. Um, but I was really enjoying them. I thought they had that nice kind of like new school, modern West Coast vibe. So it's kind of curious the approach you guys are taking. And then uh, follow up question with Hop Harvest coming up. What new varieties are you uh, excited about checking out this year? Um, yeah, curious to hear. Uh, 
look forward to uh, uh, knowing what varieties I need to check out. <laughs> Cheers, man. Joe, great to hear from you. I can't believe you're asking me a hop question. You are you are the authority I would go to for every, anything hop related. So thank you for asking. Um, to answer your question about West Coast IPA, we are you know obviously juicy bits, and we already talked about how important it is for us as a brand and, and our growth and and kind of hazy IPA and and our approach there is you know I think that's how people know us, which is awesome. It also means that we've gotten to experiment a lot with hops, and that. Uh, has been fun for the last couple of years to now start making more distinct, you know, this is a West Coast inspired version of IPA versus more of a New England inspired version that Juicy Bits kind of derives from. And I think knowing that that is kind of our core with Juicy Bits, it gives us that opportunity. We have to make something, if we want to call it West Coast or if we want to say West Coast um, style or you know, make it distinct from kind of our our normal style which is now, you know, Juicy Bits, I think, influences a lot of the other hazy IPAs we produce. We have to do something different. We have to approach it very distinctly, but also we've learned a lot about hops from making hazy IPAs. So um, we do integrate both uh, techniques, I think, especially on the dry hop side. The dry hop, um, learning what best practices are for hazy IPA, almost all of those best practices all apply to West Coast IPA. And I think- Wait, Which ones are you talking about? Uh, for us, it's probably the, you know, scheduling when we're trying to make sure, you know, there's definitely some, you know, we're trying to figure out when, when is a reasonable amount of time post fermentation or, or post, uh, pitch and whether it's during active fermentation, end of fermentation, you know, completely attenuated, um, hop creep is obviously a factor for everybody, not just hazy, not just uh, West coast. So knowing those, you know, those kinds of variables and how they change, um, Obviously, oxygen is the big one that everybody, you know, I think even at our scale is probably the one big critical point that doesn't matter what you're brewing. Um, but figuring out dry hop techniques that uh, have as little oxygen ingress as possible. Um, and then also trying to find the right uh, the right products, the right, whether it's, uh, you know, T90s or, uh, you know, we don't do anything with whole leaf, but there's definitely brewers that make amazing IPA with whole leaf. Um and we've, you know, cryo and and everything else. There's making sure you're using the right product. I think all those, all that knowledge, all applies when we're making West Coast IPA. The difference for us is obviously from the recipe side. Um, yeast is a big one. We don't use obviously the Lennon Neal three that we're using in house for everything else. Uh, we use Safe Ale um, for the most part. Uh, trying to think of the last one uh, we produced with something different some you know the thylized stuff we've experimented with as well but for most of our kind of west coast approach we're using you know cali or um, us05 and um, something very clean uh, well attenuating decent flock um, something that does and it obviously ferments a little bit less estuary um, we we don't change temperatures a whole lot they're juicy bits and even our um, our west coasts are right around the same range um, but obviously what they produce is very different. So for West coast IPA, I'd say that we're really focusing on the fruit, um, expression from hops and less on the fruit expression from esters. Whereas, um, juicy bits integrates all that it's bringing in the ester flavor and, and fruit character and integrating that with a hop expression that is fruit driven. And that's how we kind of create this, um, you know, this fruity, uh, fruit juice inspired, um, IPA versus West coast. I think we kind of go about it a little different where we're bitterness is, um, you know, obviously more to, you know, for us, it's, it's a big distinction. Um, dry hops are very similar in rate. So we're, you know, we're getting some West coast IPAs that are seeing the same hop rates and then the expression is distinct. So it's, it's also interesting to see what, uh, what kind of hop aroma in particular we're getting from maybe even the same varietals and um, obviously the yeast interactions are a little different. So whether you're, you know, seeing some biotransformation there and, and what those, those changes occur. But um, I think our, our approach to West coast so far has just been to um, do something distinct from what we do on, on the um, hazy IPA side, but also distinct from, you know, there's plenty of people making such good West coast IPA Um we can learn a lot from them, but also put our own perspective on it. And I do think our, our fruit expression of hops is, is different than a lot of folks. And so we 
can kind of bring some of that in with knowing that you can use some varietals that don't work as well in hazy IPA, something that maybe has a, we haven't had a whole lot of success with more dank expressing varietals and, and hazy IPA mainly because we're always pushing fruit. And sometimes those two combinations don't go well together that are more herbal and um, earthy and, and kind of dank expression with some really bright tropical and citrus fruit. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So um, so if I'm reading between the lines, sometimes you get some hops that don't seem to, that you want to make work in a hazy IPA and then they don't. And then you kind of have to make a, a West Coast IPA to, to use those That's hops. a great use for them. Um, <laughs> usually we're not getting very many of them, but you're right. If, right, uh, right. if we find a varietal that maybe we have even a, yeah. a large variety, that's a great you know, great opportunity to use them in a different capacity. Are there any of those hops that you tried using in hazy IPA and you're like, this is just, I can't find a way to make this work? You know, I think some of like some of our favorites, like Columbus has been a really awesome one to, you know, it's been so lot specific. We had some Columbus uh, net cutter was a couple years ago and, and the expression in net cutter from those Columbus, um, that Columbus lot was so distinct and, and almost fooled us into thinking it was a different varietal that we ended up buying the rest of what we could get access to from that spot based on the lot number. It was a spot purchase, but we went back to the vendor and said, we want the rest of that lot because it was so fruit driven. And then we've brewed with it since, and it's not been the same expression. Mm. It's been much more classic and, and that's a great candidate. We just haven't had that same success as we did. So not just varietal specific, but lot specific is, is a big factor. And I think understanding those and, and those distinctions and, um, Joe brought up hop selection. So, um, what we're kind of keeping our eyes on, that's, uh, you know, that's the one area that I think we started to realize when we got invited to selection, how big an impact that has And and Citra is very different from early harvest to late harvest and, and lot to lot. So for us having that control over what we're getting, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of, uh, for the year is has given us even better control over the quality of, of our IPA. Um, and I think, you know, when we're talking West coast IPA, that's, that's something we don't have as much you know, opportunity since we're not contracting some of those varietals, um, like we do for, you know, like Citra Mosaic and El Dorado in particular. I mean, Citra Mosaic can also work in, in those West coast IPAs oh, too. Come on. Of course. Uh, but if we're trying to do something more distinct, right, you know, it's, right. it's also hard for us to say, you know, I think, uh, clear, you know, totally West coast inspired version of the same exact top bill as juicy bits. I don't think it would be as fun. I think it'd be fun to try it, but, uh, you we haven't tried that yet. Oh, we have, we have, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as something we would make right, more regularly, right. it kind of gets lost in that, like that's back right, to the question right. of intentionality and distinction. And we do want something, not just distinct for, you know, hazy IPA, but distinct from juicy bits in our approach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to bring this all to a close. AccuBrew is an analytical tool designed to collect and compare information brewers need to produce consistent results. CanCraft Design and Aluminum Specialists are here to support your business every step of the way. g and micro-channel condensers use a fraction of the refrigerant over traditional chillers. Of course, your magazine subscription directly supports our ability to bring you this podcast each week. Go to beerandbrewing.com. Click on that subscribe button. Let us know this content matters to you. Uh, I think next up on our direct fire episodes is going to be Matt Brindleton from Firestone Walker. So, uh, hey, send your questions for that episode and for Matt, uh, who is a maestro of all things hops. And uh, I, I mean, not just hops, all sorts Everything. of many styles of beer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go yeah. ahead and record my question. Yeah, <laughs> I, hey, I, I'm going to hold you to that. Yeah. Um, but Matt Brindleton's up next. I think it'll be two weeks from now. Uh, go ahead, shoot me those questions. Podcast at beerandbrewing.com. We will get those in and get those in front of Matt and get your questions answered. Uh, of course, uh, become an all access subscriber. So you'll have first crack at tickets when they go on sale next month in September for our Brewers Retreat. 10th anniversary craft beer and brewing. 10th anniversary. 10th anniversary of craft wow. beer and brewing. Can you believe we're that old now? I cannot you, believe you've that. You've been there since episode or since issue number one. I did, it was very different uh, in perspective. It was the homebrew, uh, the barrel one, right? It was the barrel one where we uh, we covered right in issue number one. It, it was, was in the was your homebrew basement. Barrel. And but then you were also sitting on the the blind review panel back then. That's and, uh, true. Yeah, the good old days. <laughs> no. The good old days. Gosh, we're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sign up, become an all access subscriber, uh, support craft beer and brewing, and also get first crack at those tickets to the the twenty. 23 10th anniversary brewers treat send me your questions for uh, matt brindleton podcast at beer and brewing.com uh neil if people learn more about weldworks 
where do they find you? Weldworks.com. Uh, find us on so- social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, mostly Weldworks.com. And then uh, we'd love to see you here in Greeley. Thanks for, uh, and if you're a brewery in planning, yeah, sign up next uh, for our next February, our brewery workshop, New Brewery Accelerator, where we will kick things off here and you can get to see it in person and talk to Neil and give him your questions in person. Thanks for pioneering this very first direct fire episode of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast with me. It's always, always a pleasure, Neil. Always a pleasure for me too. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.